And welcome everyone to the Autonomous Collective. My name is Joe in Norway, and I'm joined by Professor Anne, who's a retired college professor, community member at the Daily Coast. She's a member of the National Council of Independent Scholars and is a contributor to the book, The Political Economy of Art, Making the Nation of Culture. Hey Anne, how's it going? Going good. Interesting right. week. Very interesting. I'm quite exhausted. I've been on the road and it's late, so I'm going to get cooking quite soon. But uh, it, it's harvest time in Norway. We, uh, I was uh, traveling back from foraging out in the wild and uh, the sheep and cows and combines were conspiring against me getting here on time. But I've Picked up a few things along the way, namely. Nice. Namely, some scars. Yeah. Some lacerations. It wasn't a bobcat or anything, but it was these gooseberries. Gooses, geeses. We've got a uh, couple different berries. I'm going to be making jam out of this evening. Uh, green gooseberries. There's two types that I'm familiar with, red and green. These ones might be a little more mild, less tart. And I'm going to make a, a nice jam out of those. And then let's see the... It looks sort of like a grape, a veiny grape, filled with little seeds. Hmm. Very tart. And then these ones, I don't remember lingonberry growing up as a kid in the Midwest, but we call these tittabar here in Norway, and they resemble miniature cranberries same exact flavor profile but just in miniature i'm going to be doing maybe chutney maybe just a standard jam not, not sure maybe with spices we'll see and i hadn't had time to prepare the pectin to do thicken it help thicken it up so we'll be using uh, very expensive apples i haven't our apples aren't quite ripe here yet, so I picked this, had this lying around, grind up the apple for the pectin to thicken up this one. And our gooseberries, I've got more, more than a few to, to make here. So we're gonna use a little uh, store-bought pectin to help us out thickening. We do have some other berries that I foraged out in the forest. We got the wild blueberries. I'm not sure what we'll do with. Maybe keep it for next week. And wild 
red raspberries. For the time being, we're gonna do gooseberries and titiba or lingonberry jam. And I think you've got a little update for us on the Ukraine you wanna head into while I get a cooking. Oh, did we lose Anne? No, I'm here. I oh. just uh, oh, swapping out hats. Um, um. So, uh, yes, I want to talk a little bit about Ukraine. Um, maybe even, well, I don't have to show the text necessarily, but uh, I'll go through this and then we'll take a, a slight break for Kelly to speak for a little bit and then I'll uh, rant at... Uh, by uh, reading some components from Naomi Klein and a variety of other things on the problems of Hawaii. And uh, so I'll, that will take an extended amount of time as you watch Joe and type. They said, okie doke now. Um, the bigger deal is that uh, Ukraine as usual, there we're in uh, day number 541, the 541st day of the war or the special military operation in uh, Ukraine. And the problem that occurred yesterday, if it's sort of a problem, it's a kind of spin from the Pentagon's point of view. I think it's meant to be a kind of contingent uh frame for the trans transfer of uh, an incredible amount of military hardware to the Ukrainians. Generally, uh, the budget has uh, the American military budget or the uh, procurement element of it uh, is continuing to work and things are being transferred. Um, the Dutch continue to talk about uh, their transfer of jets to the Ukrainians. Um, other countries are doing that. that training is occurring. It's probably already started. There's uh, issues of, uh, and you know, the, what they don't mention is that there's probably a very large infrastructure underneath the training of F-16 pilots, for example. Um, F-16s are going to be transferred by the Netherlands and a variety of other folks. And the point is that they're not going to be ready for a while. And, and I think the Pentagon wanted to sort of put a little frame around that, that it is on the one hand, a NATO training operation. On the other hand, uh, it has other elements. And of course, probably what's not being mentioned is that Ukrainian pilots probably are going to do a, a new Ukrainian pilots um, are probably going to do some stints in T-30 somewhere, somewhere else uh, in order to be prepared for S-16 flying. And all that will probably be accelerated much faster than you think. So whatever timing is being planned for uh, whatever counteroffensive, whether it Currently, they say that F-16s are not going to be available. The F-16 fighter is a multi-use fighter that's both used for interception, air-to-air -air combat, and uh, uh, ground support. Uh, it, it has a wide range of uh, armament that uh, can be used in a wide variety of situations and probably will be a, a pivotal element in uh, whatever counteroffensive is actually going to occur. Um, also, because uh, if the Ukrainians decide to get a little bit more aggressive. They can probably um, attack um, uh, things that are in the Russian airspace, but that's another story. The point being is that there's probably a lot more things going on than we know, and that's kind of the nature of the war. The war, we get kind of a, an after the fact reporting of various things. For example, there's another attack on the Kirsch Bridge. Um, there were, you know, uh, sea drones are out there. Uh, uh, there was a report this morning that uh, uh, two ships, uh, uh, one of which I think was the one that stopped or purportedly stopped a uh, a freighter uh, that was traversing from uh, the northern part of the Black Sea, the little part, the secondary port down from Odessa, uh, which travels down to Istanbul. Um, this is sort of the regular trade route that, uh, for example, for grain shipments, it uh, 
uh, it may have been attacked by a sea drum, but we don't quite have any knowledge of it yet, nor do we have any of what um, is sort of amusing to watch is the uh, the drone footage when the drone approaches uh, what it's going to hit or attack. I included in uh, today's little report that I put up on Daily Coast, the three generations of sea drums that are being developed by the Ukrainians. They started with uh, some fairly elemental explosives and moved up to shape chargers in two directions, one at the bow, one um, uh, dorsally uh, mounted that uh, can take out a, a roadway, which is what is uh, going on with uh, attacks on vehicle roadways uh, in uh, Crimea, whether it's uh, on the north end of Crimea from uh, Crimea to Kherson or on the southern area at the Kirsch Bridge. And uh, a, a lot is not being told because, you know, it's all military stuff, but it's uh, interesting to see uh, plumes of smoke that can be seen by Russian tourists uh, vacationing on the Crimean beaches. So there's there's something is happening publicly, but we don't quite know what it is. Uh, needless to say, go back to uh, Washington, the Washington Post article. There was a Washington Post article yesterday that, uh, as I said, frames a and and the, they've always been careful about their numbers and what they talk about. And in, in this particular case, they decided to quote a military analyst uh, who has a tendency to not be one sided, but he tends to look at uh, Russian success. And in fact, that's generally what um, what open source reporting looks like is to look at Russian, a lot of Russian footage, a lot of Russian disinformation and trying to disentangle much of it. For example, the Institute for the Study of War looks mainly um, because the Ukrainians don't like talking about what they do uh, um, is uh, Russian reporting on Telegram, uh, a variety of other sources. Some are reliable, some aren't. Um, in my coverage, I tend to uh, edit uh, the um, the mill blogger components because not that they're unreliable, but they are um, at certain points in opposition to the uh, the Russian military uh, ministry or defense reporting, uh, the official report, as it were. So my tendency is to try and balance the uh, Russian ministry of defense against the uh, Ukrainian reports from the general staff and uh, the Ukrainian armed forces who tend to have a slight lag in their reporting um, for a variety of, uh, you know, uh, important uh, classified reasons. And uh, lest you think that that's unimportant, the Washington Post says the problem is that there is a kind of pessimism that that the U.S. intelligence says that Ukraine won't meet the offensive's key goal. Now, we don't really quite know what that key goal was or is. Um, but the guess is in this Post article that Melitopol, this is a town, a, a central town in Hirson that uh, and you know, west of Zephyrnitia, that is a key uh, transport hub and a highway hub on the way to trying to, as it were, liberate um, Crimea. Um, originally, when um, uh, Ukraine, when these areas of Ukraine fell, initially, M Melitopol went fairly quickly. Um, what didn't go quickly was uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Mariupol, which is a, a much more heavy industrial area on uh, the shore of the Sea of Azov, which uh, resisted a Russian takeover for a long time because there is a, a very key steam, steel mill uh, that is uh, heavily reinforced uh, originally from the Cold War and uh, held out for quite a long time. So it's not a question of trying to retake certain uh, posts, but rather to uh, sever the land bridge that's been, cr been created between um, Donetsk and um, the Crimea, uh, that which is the primary Russian goal, is to seize the entire of what uh, part of what they claim is no, uh, Novo Russia, um, uh, because they want uh, full control and full land bridge access to Crimea. Now, the history of Crimea, of course, 
is in effect a history of this entire region and incredibly problematic relative to um, the riches, the mineral resources of the Southern region. And regardless of what the argument is about linguistic dominance or sovereignty and uh, by uh, what I would assert to be a much more de facto bilingualism in the Ukrainian people, it's sort of an amusing battle of maps uh, if you sort of watch uh, social media. But the WAPO, that is Washington Post article, tends to be uh, uh, a little bit more pe pessimistic. So I'll read from that. Thwarted by minefields, Ukrainian forces won't reach the city of uh, Melitopol, a vital Russian transit hub seen as a gateway to Crimea, according to U.S. intelligence assessments. The U.S. intelligence community assesses that Ukraine's counteroffensive will fail to reach the key southeastern city of Melitopol. People familiar with the classified forecast told the Washington Post a finding that, should it prove correct, would mean Kiev won't fulfill its principal objective of severing Russians, Russia's land bridge to Crimea in this year's push. Now, let me, this year's push, you know, the, the whole thing is in, in some ways, the expectation of the Pentagon is that the war will continue for another year or two. It's problematic to believe that. And for those who are against war, either war in general or war in particular, this is a problematic aspect, consider, considering the casualties are up into the half millions with the death toll uh, probably going to hit 100,000 very soon uh, on both sides. So it, it is incredibly problematic. So back to reading. The grim assessment is based on uh, Russia's brutal proficiency in defending occupied territory through a phalanx of minefields and trenches and is likely to prompt finger pointing inside Kyiv and Western capitals about why a counteroffensive that saw tens of billions of dollars of Western weapons and military equipment fall short of its goals. Ukraine's forces, which are pushing toward Melitopol from the town of uh, Robotyne, uh, more than 50 miles away, will remain several miles outside of the city, U.S. officials said. Melitopol is critical to Ukraine's counteroffensive because it is considered the quote-unquote gateway to Crimea. The city is at the intersection of two important highways and a rail, railroad line that allow Russia to move military personnel and equipment from the peninsula to other occupied territories in southern Ukraine. A reminder, of course, is that uh, uh, Russia has annexed four oblasts or states in the, in the, the south of Ukraine, and they wish to keep them. Uh, the current issue is uh, at any point relative to negotiations is that they want to freeze the freeze the line of uh, contact, uh, at least where it is now, so that they have most of southern Ukraine. The Ukraine, the Ukrainian army is uh, probing on a 600-mile front across this area and uh, making some progress. There uh, was reports last week of tactical progress um, on the part that is nearest uh, Donetsk uh, in Zaporizhia and uh, a slight uh, uh, advance in Hirson across uh, the Dnipro. So this is, uh, there are interesting things happening, but as I said before, we know them kind of a little bit after the fact. Um, and for the last week or so, there have been uh, uh, contradictory reports about probes, uh, military probes coming across the Dnipro. And of course, a, uh, associated articles that talk about the training of Ukrainian Marines uh, a brigade-sized uh, force that is uh, uh, pretty well trained and now uh, uh, in country, as it were, after having been trained with the uh, uh, the United Kingdom's Royal Marines. So they're um, they were already very good. Uh, this is a much more in terms of coordinated attack, and I think that some things are happening in interesting places that we'll probably know a little bit more about in a couple of days. Um, it's always tough for writing every day to try and sift through what is or isn't happening and try not to overstate what is, you know, being destroyed or what is being captured, et cetera. Uh, otherwise, you get tied up in the kind of uh, uh, disinformation dynamics of, of the story. So and I don't like having to correct myself.
U.S. officials said that the uh, Pentagon recommended multiple times that Ukraine concentrate a large mass of forces on a single breakthrough point. This is very much in the same U.S. doctrine as what happened in, for example, um, Iraq, uh, the attack on Iraq in 2003, um, uh, where a thrust by uh, Marine Division, uh, particularly Marine Divisions, um, uh, straight through uh, uh, in a single concentrated attack uh, with associated air support um, was meant to uh, be efficient. But as we know, if you've read some of the reporting, particularly the on-ground reporting, it was problematic because it stretched uh, logistical support and was essentially a uh, an attempt by the then uh, 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 U.S. forces under uh, George W. Bush to um, do it on the cheap, so, so to speak. Um, anyway, though Ukraine opted for a different strategy, officials said it was Kiev's call to make to make, given the profound sacrifice Ukrainian troops were making on the battlefield. And the point is, of course, that Ukrainian doctrine is not so much designed around a single uh, breakthrough, but with a 600 mile front uh, to do lots of slightly um, smaller probes, but smaller probes that are act that actually run at fairly high speed with quicker encirclement. If you look at the doctrine, if you compare the Russian doctrine with the Ukrainian doctrine, um, the Russians choose to have a wider, uh, more massive front to push through, very much like the the uh, U.S. model, whereas the Ukrainians like to make smaller breakthroughs but encircle faster. Um, so they they envelop quicker and move faster, which uh, is from a, a scale point of view actually much better. Now the problem, of course, has been minefields, which is the Pentagon's excuse for. Uh, why things have been moving slowly. And of course, this is uh, uh, widely argued in uh, mainstream media. There are three lines of uh, defensive uh, arrangements of uh, uh, armaments uh, uh, made stronger with stronger uh, field points with a million mines now being laid, at least across uh, in uh, Zaporizhia. There are plenty of mines everywhere. Demining equipment is in place. There has been no reporting about failures of major failures of demining equipment. So one assumes that demining operations continue to, to go on. There's a actually a variety of uh, very interesting side articles on the the quality of demining technology that is, that has existed. Uh, if any advancement is going to occur during this period, it is in um, demining uh, technology uh, on the ground. The path to Melitopol is an extremely challenging one, and even recapturing closer cities such as Pokhmak will be difficult, said Rob Lee, a military analyst with the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Quote, Russia has three main defensive lines there and then fortified cities after that, he said. It's not just a question about whether Ukraine can breach one or two of them, but can they breach all three and have enough forces available after taking attrition to achieve something more significant, like taking Tokhmak or something beyond that. So it's all hedging here. And there are three lines, and it is three lines that are identifiable with trench works and uh, strong points and minefields and way at the back uh, artillery. So this is, um, you know, with respect, very much like the World War II kind of approach to doctrine in uh, defense of it holding a territory, one wonders, as as I think um, if you've been looking at the news so far, is uh, conscription is coming up and it's going to be an issue for the Russians to be able to have a reasonable sized uh, military in place, although they are uh, moving up uh, recruits from um, even including, as I understand it, uh, some elements of the Rosgardia um, uh, so you have a variety of uh, Russian replacement of labor forces, of, of the forces of troop movements since the um, <clears throat> Prigozhin Wagner march, so-called march to Moscow, which uh, at the current moment seems to be still in, in the area of trying to uh, sort of deorganize whatever uh, uh, the the Wagner forces and one wonders what shape the private military corporation called Wagner 
is going to be in at the end of the war. Uh, certainly, Prigozhin is still alive and still, you know, uh, keeping a relatively low profile, despite his sort of bargaining with Belarus. Belarus has been relatively quiet, although um, there is a, a a sort of contingency that's being built up, I think, at uh, in the Latvian and Polish sectors um, on the road to Kaliningrad. So this, this is still there. Uh, I think everyone is on alert. Nothing specific has occurred other than a couple of weeks ago, a transgression by Belarusian helicopters into Polish airspace. Now, Ukrainian uh, naval drones have conducted two strikes against a pair of RU Project 22160 patrol ships. Those are the same ships, as I said, that had attempted to interfere with a civilian um, ship traffic. The attacks unfolded at um, uh, last night at uh, uh, about 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock local time. And uh, uh, 237 kilometers southwest of the Sevastopol naval base. And uh, now, at that position, places it pretty much out in the middle of, uh, well, in the midst of uh, a kind of territory that should be ultimately defended by uh, Ukraine in terms, if you believe in a certain type of sovereignty. Per usual, the Russians are claiming that the, uh, the drones were destroyed. I think we'll know a little bit more uh, subsequently. In other uh, attack news, uh, the Ukrainians brought down a couple more helicopters, um, intercepted a significant amount of uh, the daily drone attacks of a variety of sorts across the entire Ukrainian nation. Uh, recent Ukrainian advances near small settlements in the Donetsk, Zapranisha, um, uh, uh Oblast border area in western Zaporizhia Oblast are likely tactically significant because of the structure of Russian uh, defensive lines. And so there's a report on that. On a side note, an imprisoned former Russian Federal Protection Service, these are the people who, who are uh, uh, charged with su uh, supporting members of the government. It's a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Gennady uh, Lopryev. A, uh, he's a former Lieutenant General in the Russian uh, Federal Protection Service. He was serving a sentence for bribery in a penal colony in, uh, a colony in Ryazan, Moblast. Uh, well, he died this week, and uh, he died unexpectedly. And he was diagnosed with leukemia on August 14th. And sudden, you know, he suddenly got sick and died. Now, the insider source in this uh, reporting, and this is uh, ISW's reporting, so it has a fair amount of credibility, claimed uh, Lopriev uh, was the keeper of secrets related to the construction of Russian President Vladimir Putin's Black Sea residence in Glendensk, <clears throat> often referred to as Putin's palace. It's um, an area north of, uh, it's a fairly isolated peninsula uh, uh, west of Sochi, northwest of Sochi, and a pretty significant place. He, he doesn't Putin technically doesn't own it. This is the whole business about Putin's wealth is that he doesn't own a lot of things, but in fact, he sort of owns them because other proxies uh, own these things. It's kind of like the yacht that he gets to use, um, but he doesn't own that yacht, even though there are two yachts that are identical and he gets to use one of them. Anyway, uh, the counteroffensive is actually making technically significant advances um, and uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things happening. Uh, there is a kind of NATO umbrella, at least for the uh, civilian sea traffic. A large uh, container ship, uh, a fairly large container ship, uh, has uh, made the route safely. Um, there has been a, a, a number of air patrols. They have moved um, NATO and a variety of other forces have um, um, unarmed surveillance in the area, and they are now tending to monitor civilian air traffic, uh, waiting for some of these things to occur. It's sad that they do have to occur, but in some ways they need to be able to uh, make sure that civilian traffic, which has been backed up for a couple of weeks in Ukraine, uh, begin to transfer things like grain, despite the uh, Russians pulling out of the grain deal, although negotiations are still going on, 
there is significant, you know, uh, things got to move and it is uh, problematic. So the takeaways are that uh, there are advances, uh, uh, not a lot of retreating. Uh, there's a ramp up of domestic production of in Russia of Iranian Shahid uh, uh, drones. Uh, it uh, the the Russians are having a, a a slight dissatisfaction, I think, with the relative quality of them because they're so easily uh, shot down. But they're that is because they're fairly cheap to build, but they do have a very large uh, a major production facility already completed and running in Russia, far back beyond the lines. Uh, Russian reports about the state of the Chunhar Bridge. This is one of the bridges that got hit in attacks uh, both by sea drones and by aerial drones in uh, Kherson uh, Oblast, indicate that Ukrainian strikes disrupted a major Russian ground line of communication, these are called GLOCs, the Russian ground line of communication. Um, and so uh, the problem, as I mentioned last week, was that in order to make a two hour trip by, by car, uh, the two hour trip by car takes you about 11 hours. So it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, uh, problematic, uh, needless to say. And so uh, that sort of concludes my Ukrainian discussion. Uh, uh, and I, where are we in terms of? I, I had a question tonight? about um, one thing. It's harvest time. Uh, I mentioned that the uh, combines were were uh, blocking our one-way traffic today. Uh, I was wondering how the harvest is going in Ukraine under the circumstances, as far as being able to harvest and be able to ship out from the, the breadbasket. Fortunately, the line of contact isn't quite so bad. And um, the breadbasket, fortunately for the for the Ukrainians, is in the center of the country. Now, it's true that a lot of crops have been affected by, in, in Harrison, have been affected by the digging of trenches and a variety of other things. So a certain percentage of the uh, Ukrainian output uh, of uh, you know produce and a variety of other things has been uh, um, uh, affected, but in general, um, you know combines are at work uh, in the fields mm -hmm. in central part. Uh, the problem, of course, is and uh, missile attacks generally tend to go towards cities, so mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so that what hasn't happened and which is certainly within the Russians' capability our attempts to destroy the crops of uh, Ukraine. They haven't gone in that direction with biological weapons, which they could do, but they haven't, thank goodness. Uh, they did accidentally attack about a month ago, uh, attack a, a, a bunch of combines because they thought they were tanks. And there's a video of it, which is quite amusing to hear the Russian pilots, you know, say, well, we're going to attack this thing. And then, you know, after they blow it up, it's it's sort of uh, it's a combine. Jeez, you know. Uh, so that's kind of what what goes on. I'm sure there are other events. This one was quite notable mm. because you had a a you know full scale attack helicopter with video and two of them and a drone and a bunch of other things, and they managed to kill something that they thought was a tank that's not a tank. It reminds me of the collateral murder video uh, with the mm -hmm. wiki week lakes released from Iraq. Oh, so we, yes. we had some community announcements today from Kelly in Nebraska and Nancy. Uh, Kelly, are you ready to go? Yes, sorry for okay. the- Should I bring, bring you up on camera? Uh, that would be- Great, I can turn yeah, on my camera is... and oh, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and find my letter. Yep, I found that. Or do you have to share or? Uh, I can screen... share. Screen share, you don't need the spotlight then? Um, no, that's fine. I can oh. go ahead and talk yep. and then go ahead and put up my, um, yeah, so All right. thank you. Um, I'm Kelly. I'm part of the Autonomous Collective, and on Wednesday nights, uh, we gather and uh, uh, 
have a, a kind of a, a a Zoom meeting uh, gathering. We talk about spirituality and activism. Um, we read books um, by Paulo Freire. Um, had uh, guest visitors uh, talk about different religions. Um, we have a uh, former uh, high school religion teacher who um, has taught us a great deal about the world's religions. Um, and then the activism. Uh, we've done lots of uh, writing, letter writing, um, and discussion on effectiveness of how to contact our um, uh, elected officials, as well as talking about the Poor People's Campaign, um, which is something that is close to my heart. So uh, that's what we do on Wednesdays. Uh, this past Wednesday, uh, one of our wonderful participants uh, showed us a, a few um, news clips from Democracy Now! Uh, about the fire in Maui. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, we're all concerned. It was, um, even though I hate to say we're, we've seen this before, um, this isn't the first time uh, climate crisis um, influenced um, devastation has happened. And so I expressed a lot of frustration uh, with the fact that, that these, these events keep happening. And so uh, we did, we're all very knowledgeable. Um, we pay attention to the news. Um, there's a little bit of exasperation on my point, um, my part, because, you know, uh, so, so little is being done um, compared to the magnitude of the problem. And so I I committed to, at the very least, write a letter to Joe Biden. Um, it was mentioned that Joe Biden was on the cusp of declaring a climate emergency. And so uh, if it's one thing that I can do, and hopefully others, is uh, nudge him over that edge. Um, it's it's more than reasonable and not a big ask in my opinion. And so what I've done is I've put together uh, a quick uh, letter and it's not very long, I'll go ahead and read it. And uh, what I want you all to understand is it's there on Discord for you to use. So you don't have to, let's say, recreate the wheel again, just copy it, paste it, write it out, change it to however you see fit and send it. Um, let's just get letters multiplied on these topics. They do track um, uh, these offices of our elected uh, leaders. They, they track topics that they get information about, especially if they're written letters um, that are mailed through the old fashioned mail. If you don't have time, send it by email you'll still get a response. So anyway, here is my letter. I'm going to, oh, wait, I need to share screen. All right, and it says, Dear Mr. President, I understand that you are considering designating our climate crisis as a state of emergency. It's a relief that we have a leader that is seriously monitoring and is listening to climate scientists on this increasingly destructive phenomena of wildfires and flash floods. The recent fire in Maui, Hawaii, while not directly caused by climate change, was exacerbated by conditions that were because of climate change, particularly dried out vegetation, three digit temperatures and high winds. Our American flags are at half staff today as our country collectively mourns the complete raising of a historic town and obliterating its community. But we need, not, we need to stop looking at these apocalyptic events in isolation. Paradise, California, Boulder, Colorado, Los Angeles, California, even Hurricane Ida's flooding of New York City in 2021 have causal roots in our human created climate crisis. 
As time goes on, we will have more frequent and more extreme events that cause devastation to other communities. I dread to find out whose towns are next, but we know, thanks to science, that we will find out sooner rather than later. I am urging I am urging you to begin leading the nation out of this climate disaster by declaring a climate emergency today. We have no time to lose, respectfully, Kelly. And so there you go. Uh, please use it. Um, please send it uh, to all of your elected officials. That's what I'm going to do. And just um, get it going. It no, it's it's not going to fix the problem, but we need to start nudging nudging our elected officials in the right um, direction. There is more to do, and I am really open to hearing ideas about action. Um, so that's it, and thank you all for your time. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. We had another activity uh, that Nancy started, a writer's workshop. Uh, Nancy, did you want to yeah. tell a little Hi. bit about what's going on with the writer's workshop? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like we use lots of writing in uh, the meetings that we conduct. And it occurred to me that we can write too. Uh, we don't have to write anything uh, for publication, although, you know, that could happen. Uh, we don't have to write anything for uh, class credit but we can write, we can write for pleasure, uh, we can write just to exercise that skill. So we've done two meetings, uh, people are bringing short pieces of original writing, it could be anything, poetry, prose, fiction, nonfiction, uh, old or new, uh, and it's gone quite well. We've uh, had, I think, five people have uh, brought something. And there's a little bit of hesitation. People are a little shy about it, but uh, I think when the reading gets done, it's very satisfying. So, I would uh, encourage anybody to think about participating in this. Uh, I provide a prompt on the Discord, but that isn't, uh, it's not necessary to follow the prompt, but just for someone who might not uh, come up with an idea instantaneously uh, this week, it was to write about a non-human animal that you love or, uh, oh, what was the, oh, the other one was uh, to write about a time when you had a revelation that changed your mind about something that you had believed. So, uh, it will be the next one Saturday at 2 Eastern time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And the one on Monday, will, will the regular schedule be on Monday as well? Yeah, uh, we, did, we have Easter. done two uh, meetings, Mondays at 7 Eastern time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so I think think we'll continue and see when people uh, when it's when it's a good time for people but right now it would be seven on Monday evening eastern time or Saturday at 2 p.m also eastern time and 
we so we're not getting graded on our chatting is that correct but, no uh, you can grade yourself if you really <laughs> feel the need but i don't i don't do grading <laughs> Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. I've got the one jam down so far. I've, I've got the lingonberry all finished. Had just a little too much, almost enough for one one jar. These are the traditional uh, Nordica gla glass. Got a little label in Norway on it. These are traditional, the kind of uh, mason jar of Norway, basically. So, yeah. Nice little jam. Typically, this is used on meats, wild meats. Used like cranberry. And I'm starting to almost reach the gel point on the gooseberry. It's all more or less disintegrated. And it's still maintained a greenish, greenish brown type of color. Would be nice and pretty. Dry this up shortly. Don't quite what have the a proper bath. I'm just going to be about uh, 10, 10 or 15. Closer to 10. I heard you had. Something to rant about, man? Ah, uh, yes. It's uh, rant time. And uh, uh, let me remind everyone first that uh, we do have a website. It's uh, theautonomouscollective.net. The all together, T H E A U T O N O M O U S collective.net. Uh, it rolls off your fingers as you type. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> Even autocorrect should be correct. And so uh, hopefully uh, you can come and uh, come and join us. Uh, we're on Discord. We um, will soon be on other other kinds of platforms. And we're hoping to uh, get other like people to come on down and, and chat with us about a variety of things, generally, generally left-oriented, if you're uh, of that... Uh, uh, sort of a persuasion, as they say. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm going to use uh, uh, Kelly's template letter to uh, write to my own congressperson and uh, let them know what I, I'm going to tailor it to my own. I'm not personally don't like I'm, I'm not going to write to the president, uh, although, man, well, maybe I will. Anyway, I'm I'm probably going to post my version of it, as it were, on uh, Daily Coast, which I I fortunately or unfortunately appear on um, every night around midnight uh, to talk about Ukraine, which is what I was reading from today of today's uh, report. There's a uh, day five forty two is coming up, uh, and we will um, uh, be talking about a variety of other things, uh, not about the U.S. policy, but perhaps something. Uh, else many things occur in a 24-hour period we try and keep to that uh, similarly on the issue of kelly's letter and that is the question of a climate emergency a climate crisis i'm going to rant a, a little bit about a uh, and read from a particular article um, that uh, appeared in the guardian um, <clears throat> uh, yesterday by naomi klein and Kapwala. Uh, Sprout, who uh, teaches law at uh, um, the Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, uh, but who also does uh, native law, which Hawaii is all about, and uh, relative to uh, indigenous people's issues in the United States of America, Hawaii is one example of a particular intersection of uh, not unlike some uh, other indigenous peoples in the United States, of uh, natural resources, uh, in this case, an island, and uh, native peoples. And I'm going to do a little bit of history of Hawaii, 
Um, full disclosure, my uh, my mother's side of the family is from Hawaii. And um, while I've not lived there and only visit, uh, have only visited, I think you, uh, you know, you always have a kind of connection to that, those kind of um, ancestral connections, as it were, uh, just despite the fact that it only, for me, only goes back a century uh, in the in that particular context, not unlike uh, Ukrainians who uh, had perhaps been born and raised in the United States have for the current war in Ukraine. So the history of uh, Hawaii is uh, is one that uh, is uh, highly problematic and only until fairly recently has has begun to recognize the question of uh, indigenous and native peoples in uh, in Hawaii and the complexity of territorialization that is the annexation that uh, that America did during its uh, as it were early early period of imperialism at the late <clears throat> in the latter half of the 19th century and this is part of a, a a variety of colonial activities particularly in the Pacific and we're currently in what is called an Indo-Pacific set of initiatives relative to as uh, as you'll note from today's news the uh, 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 trilateral agreement with uh, South Korea and Japan, um, uh, partially in response to China, but it also helps the coordination, I think, of, of what are a variety of not only, uh, as it were, military agreements, but also uh, diplomatic elements that will hopefully smooth over some of the um, more specific territorial conflicts that are going to occur in, uh, for example, the South China Seas. And lest you think this is a, a recent activity, this this problem of the South China Sea goes back to whether it was the South China Sea and goes back much, much further, in fact, centuries uh, earlier. But that's for another another story. In the case of uh, <clears throat> Hawaii, and you've heard of uh, the, the, the horrible fires in Maui that have resulted at the current uh, the last I looked, there were 111 dead and many children still missing. So it's still a, uh, you know, um, a certain type of recovery operation going on right now. Um, needless to say, a variety of narratives have been applied to, um, to Maui and it being the kind of uh, colonial center for many things relative to the history of Hawaii, but it doesn't take watching films like Aloha or The Descendants, the uh, George Clooney film of uh, in 2011, to see how Hawaii has or hasn't changed from the moment it was colonially annexed by the United States. From the initial formation of the unified kingdom of Hawaii under a single sovereign in 1795 to its admission as the 50th state of the U.S. in 1959, Hawaiians have adapted to shifting political, economic, and social realities. Now, that's the official version from the state. Um, it's a much more tortured history and one that is clearly about settler colonialism, uh, plantation culture, things that are part of American history, a very clear and important part of uh, American colonial history. And one that certainly extends, uh, has a much wider scope now that we've been more sensitized to the to the nature of the depth of uh, American colonial history. I urge you to look at a, a variety of these earlier histories. Uh, uh, hopefully you've been more sensitized to that kind of set of questions by uh, media, that is, uh, uh, the kind of popular television shows like uh, Hawaii Five O or Magnum PI, um, these are programs which, of course, are generally uh, uh, procedural crime type programs and and interesting um, because both engage the question of the public. That is the the state of Hawaii's task force Five uh, O. Um, uh, covering all of the the islands and uh, the kind of private investigation that uh, uh, Magnum PI represents, and more recently the NCIF version um, of Hawaii, uh, located in Hawaii, 
all of which use the same general production facility. So, you know, whatever, but uh, on, so they have the kind of same look, but uh, on the other hand, I, you know, if you've uh, ever been to Hawaii, you like kind of looking at uh, the locations, at least uh, in the middle of winter, you can imagine where you should be. So in the terms of the story, in his message to the Congress on December 18th, 1893, uh, President Grover Cleveland acknowledged that the Hawaiian kingdom was unlawfully invaded by the United States Marines on January 16th, 1893, which led to an illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government the following day. The president told the Congress that he, quote, instructed Minister Willis to advise the Queen, Queen Kamehameha, and her supporters of his desire to aid in the restoration of the status existing before the lawless landing of the United States forces at Honolulu on the 16th of January last, if such restoration could be effected upon terms providing for clemency as well as justice to all parties concerned. This is in um, uh, the congressional record. Um, what the president didn't know at the time, that is President Grover Cleveland, didn't know at the time he gave his message was that Minister Willis succeeded in securing an agreement with the queen that committed the United States to restore her as the executive monarch. And thereafter, the queen committed to granting amnesty to the insurgents. Now, these insurgents, who are these insurgents? They're a group of... Um, folks educated Americans, some Americans, some from other countries, in fact, educated on the mainland and a variety of Hawaiians educated on the mainland. So this is a kind of interesting insurgency, not unlike other kinds of insurgencies. Uh, I will remind you of the imposition of, um, of extra colonial um, entities or parties in the uh, um, the reestablishment of the government of Iraq, uh, where we uh, impose new rulers. But anyway, in, um, back to the reading here, uh, international law recognizes the, this executive agreement as a treaty. The president, however, President Grover Cleveland, did not carry out his duty under the treaty to restore the queen, and consequently, the queen did not grant amnesty to the insurgents so much for bureaucracy so the state of war continued and the insurgency of course was not recognizing the uh that question of native rule but rather they wanted annexation to the united states and unless you think these are unimportant matters the history of puerto rico among others is the uh, is also has a kind of similar history and uh these kinds of things are interesting problems. President Cleveland acknowledged that those individuals who, who he sought the Queen's consent to grant amnesty to were not a government at all. In fact, he stated that they were neither a government de facto nor de jure. Instead, President Cleveland referred to these individuals as, quote unquote, insurgents, which by definition are, quote unquote, rebels who revolt against an established government. Kind of like January 6th. Under Chapter 6 of the Hawaiian Penal Code, a revolt against the government is treason, which carries the punishment of death and property of the convicted of the convicted is seized by the Hawaiian government. Now, had there been some other quasi-colonial power to ensure that uh, uh, to kind of interfere, uh, it certainly there certainly would be have been an alternative outcome. But on July third. 1894, it's like six months later, the insurgents renamed themselves the Republic of Hawaii and continued to seek annexation with the United States. Article 32 of its so-called constitution states, quote, the president with the approval of the cabinet is hereby expressly authorized and empowered to make a treaty of political or commercial union between the Republic of Hawaii and the United States of America, subject to the ratification of the U.S. Senate. The insurgents, therefore, always sought to be annexed by the United States. So you have an interesting thing before the League of Nations or the UN of something, you know, there are no international courts to arbitrate these matters. Uh, colonialism gets to do what sort of what it does, or imperialism gets to do what it, what, do what it wants. 
note, of course, in this context, the there are a bunch of things that uh, Hawaii, as a a system of plantations and uh, developed in and after a kind of colonial settlement and in terms of the relation to the British, et cetera, are uh, have trade relations with the United States among others. Um, but it is up to that moment a kingdom. The Hawaiian Kingdom or Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, it was a sovereign state located in the Hawaiian Islands. That's the archipelago there. The country was formed in, 19, in 1795 when the warrior chief Kamehameha, the great of the independent island of Hawaii, conquered the independent islands of Oahu, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. I mention Lanai here because essentially it is kind of where we are now. Uh, the interesting problem of a kind of feudal commercial power. Oh, why do I say that? Larry Ellison of Oracle, the Oracle Corporation of so many other sort of nice things that Oracle sponsors, you know, America's Cup, um, a great uh, uh, venue for the Golden State Warriors, etc. He owns 98% of the island of Lanai. 2% is owned by the government of Hawaii. I think it's all of our, our favorite fantasies to either get a uh, a remote island and take it for our own. Um, but I think that's a fantasy reserved primarily for the very, very ultra rich and um, kind of cool, I guess. So, so that wasn't Mark Zuckerberg that had the other 2%. Uh, yes. No, it, it was wasn't. the government. No, no Larry's got a place has... to hide. <laughs> Well, essentially, he's developing the only uh, city. There's a resort on the island, and it has a significant development. And, you know, you can stay mm -hmm. and hang out and play golf and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but he owns, mm -hmm. you know, everything. It's his island. I, I suppose that's a fantasy um, that so many people have. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, among others. Uh, I often wonder why uh, Donald Trump had did not harbor such fantasies, but it it uh, it is quite amusing. Um, and anyway, well, he's were... a true blooded patriotic continental American. Uh, indeed, also he hates flying. Um, so whatever, and I don't think he likes tropical weather either. Um, I think he likes playing golf in tropical weather, but uh, pretty much that's it. Anyway, all these islands got unified under one government, and in 1810, the whole. Hawaiian archipelago became unified when Kauai and Niahu Hau, Niahu, uh, joined the Hawaiian kingdom voluntarily. Two major dynastic families ruled the kingdom, you know, dynastic families like the Kennedys, um, the House of Kamehameha and the House of Kal Kalakakua. Um, anyway, the kingdom won recognition from the major European powers. The United States became its chief trading partner and watched over it, watched over it to prevent other powers such as Britain and Japan from asserting hegemony. Britain and Japan have always had a colonial interest in uh, Hawaii. And if you've ever been to Hawaii, you note the number of uh, Japanese who spend their tourist time in Hawaii. And it's been that way for centuries. In 1887, uh, King uh, Kalakakua was uh, Kalakaua was uh, support, uh, forced to support a new constitution in a coup by the Honolulu, Honolulu Rifles, an anti-monarchist militia. Oh, how so many anti-monarchist militias. Uh, <clears throat> Queen uh, Lili Ukokalani, who succeeded <laughs> Kalakakua in uh, 1891, tried to abrogate the new constitution. She was overthrown in 1893, which I just described, largely at the hands. Note that we've been talking in our little group here about last night. We we looked at uh, La Commune, a, a uh, film by uh, Peter Watkins on the Paris Commune of 1871. The P Committee of Safety in Hawaii, a group including Hawaiian subjects and resident foreign nationals, darn outside educators, of American, British, and German descent, many educated in the United States. Hawaii was briefly an independent republic until the U.S. annexed it on July 4th, 
in the Newlands Resolution in 1898, which created the territory of Hawaii, um, also known as, quote unquote, the Apology Resolution, acknowledged that the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii uh, and the Apology Resolution is of 1993. It occurred with the active participation. Remember, I've been talking about the kind of um, the reworking of Hawaii history in the United States by acknowledging the, the native peoples in, in a much more significant way, that the native Hawaiian people never directly relinquished to the United States their claims to their, their inherent sovereignty as a people over their national lands, either through the Kingdom of Hawaii or through a plebiscite or referendum. So this is, to use a kind of analogy and not perfectly identical, but the same acknowledgement that we do for indigenous peoples on the mainland, that is uh, Native Americans or Indians. Um, this is a similar issue of recognition and highly problematic relative to the fact that it's a darn island. So after the invasion, the US seized control of the entire governmental infrastructure, this is in the 19th centuries, they called themselves the provisional government. They they renamed themselves as the Republic. And then they, on April 30th, 1900, 1900, the United States Congress renamed the insurgents as the Territory of Hawaii by a congressional act. And on March 18th, 1959, the U.S. Congress, again by congressional act, changed the name of the Territory of Hawaii to the State of Hawaii. Now, you know, that's a long time. Um, this type of policy instituted by the occupying state. Now, I, I want you to take care to observe what this count counts as, because it's certainly being applied in other events. This type of policy initiated by the occupying state, that is the U.S., is called denationalization, which was codified, codified by the Commission on the Responsibility of the Authors of War and Enforcement of Penalties as a war crime in 1919 this is the moment remember in 1919 when countries after world war one were divesting themselves of many of their colonial territories and war crimes were certainly part of this this particular war crime addressed the attempts to denationalize serbs when serbia was occupied during world war one by austria bulgaria and germany note of course that this hasn't has been resolved in terrible, terrible ways for, for nearly a century. In the 1947 Nuremberg trial of Ulrich Greifelt and others, Nazis were prosecuted for attempting to denationalize Poles, Alsace-Lorrainers. Now note, of course, that Alsace-Lorraine has been fought over since the Franco-Prussian War of 18 of 1870. So, needless to say, that and we've become interested in that relative to the Paris Commune and among other things. And Slovenes, uh, Slovenia being, of course, an interesting country, aside from being the birthplace of uh, Melania Trump, through a policy of Germanization. <laughs> note that Germanization, like not unlike Russification, Germanization in occupied Poland during World War II. And if you can't see the analogy to the current state of affairs in the Ukraine, Russo-Ukrainian war, you know, that's I, I, I pity the fool, as uh, 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 Mr. T would say. Now, I place this in reference to the George Clooney film, The Descendants of 2011. Um, and I hope you've seen it. It's a, it's a nice little film. It's, it's classified as a comedy. It's not quite so funny. And in fact, it's probably a more a dramedy in, 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 in terms of uh, the neologisms that we place on such films. But it's an interesting question because it is about um, ancestral heritage in the corporate uh, uh, development of my uh, synopsis of the film is uh, Matt King, played by uh, George Clooney, is a Honolulu-based lawyer and the sole trustee of a family trust that controls 25,000 acres. This is taken from a novel. Uh, so there's an original novel from which this uh, uh, movie was developed. 25,000 acres of pristine land on the island of Kauai. The trust will expire in seven years because of, because of the rule against perpetuities. 
You see, this is this re re recognition of sovereign land. So the King family has decided to sell the land to Kauai native Don Hollitzer for development. Now, lest you think that that's unimportant, that's currently what the issue is for people on Maui after the fire. In Robert. Uh, in Roger Ebert's review, he states that what happens is that we get vested in the lives of these characters. That's rare in a lot of movies. We come to understand how they think and care about what they decide. There are substantial moral problems underlying the plot. We should be so invested in Maui, even though we've never been there. All over Maui, golf courses glisten emerald green. Hotels manage to fill their pools and corporations stockpile water to sell to luxury estates. And yet, when it came time to fight the fires, some hoses ran dry. Why? Naomi Klein's uh, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and Kapuala Sprout's article in The Guardian, yesterday's Guardian, asked that kind of question. The, the reason is the long running battle over West Maui's most precious natural resource, and that is water. Unless you think this is unimportant in American, in the history of America, certainly in the Western states, water rights, riparian rights are the most, are probably more important than other kinds of rights, even though we care about air rights and land rights and a variety of other things. Water rights are more problematic because they cross multiple territories and hence uh, become a much more ubiquitous kind of legal kind of question. <sighs> That's why on Tuesday, 8 August, when Kerarari Chandler Tao, Lao, Chandler Lao, was fleeing the fires and grabbed a box of clothes, some food, and something a little unconventional, a box filled with water use permit applications. Now, why would you, you know, your go bag has... Uh, <laughs> stuff you need to stay alive but you it has a box filled with water use permit application despite her personal calamity terrorari a grassroots attorney already knew that the fight for maui's future was about to intensify and at its heart would not be fire but another element entirely that is water specifically the water rights of native hawaiians rights that a long parade of plantations Real estate developers and luxury resorts have been stifling for nearly two centuries. Two centuries. As the flames approached, Terrari uh, feared that under cover of emergency, those large players might finally get their chance to grab West Maui's water for good. She also knew something else that the only force with hope, with a hope of stopping that theft, would be organized grassroots communities, even though those very communities were already stretched to breaking point saving lives and searching for lost loved ones. Disaster capitalism, the well-worn tactic of exploiting moments of extreme collective trauma to rapidly push through unpopular laws that benefit a small elite relies on this cruel dynamic, disaster capitalism. As Lee Cataluna, an indigenous, an indigenous Maui-born journalist, observed recently the people on the frontier, front lines of disaster are necessarily focused on survival stuff. Announcements, services, instructions, help. Go here to get gas. Look at this list to see if your husband's name is there. They're focused on that, not on coercive real estate deals or backroom policy moves, which is exactly why the tactic too often succeeds. And lest you think that this is unimportant, you know, people will take your property off of you because, you know, there's nothing there anymore, right? It's, you, your house has been gone. It's, it could be a tornado or some other thing. And you have uh, liquidity, cash in hand, uh, pennies on the dollar, as it were. You still get something to go with, uh, uh, ready cash, but you also lose title. Disaster capitalism has taken many forms in different contexts. In New Orleans, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, there was an immediate move to replace public schools with charter schools and to bulldoze public housing projects to make way for gentrifying townhouses. In Puerto Rico, after Hurricane Maria in 2017, the public schools were once again under siege, and there was a push to privatize the electricity grid before the storm had made landfall. 
In Thailand and Sri Lanka, after the 2004 tsunami, valuable beachfront land previously stewarded by small-scale fishers and farmers was seized by real estate developers while their rightful occupants were stuck in evacuation camps. It's always a little different, which is why some Native Hawaiians had taken to calling their unique version by a slightly different term, plantation disaster capitalism. Plantation cap disaster capitalism is a name that speaks to contemporary forms of neocolonialism and climate profiteering, like the real estate agents who have been cold calling Lahaina residents who have lost everything to the fire and prodding, prodding them to sell their ancestral lands rather than wait for compensation. But it also places these moves inside the long and ongoing history of settler colonial resource theft and trickery, making clear that while disaster capitalism might have some modern disguises, it's a very old tactic, a tactic that Native Hawaiians have a great deal of experience resisting. Which brings us back to what was in that box that Terari rescued and the place of water in this fateful moment. For over a century, water across Maui, <clears throat> Komahana, the western region of the island, has been extracted to benefit outside interests. First, it was large sugar plantation and more recently their corporate successors. The companies, including WML, that is West Maui Land Company or Corporation, and its subsidiaries, as well as uh, Kanapali Land Management and Maui Land and Pineapple Inc. Incorporated, have devoured the land's natural resources to develop McMansions. McMansions are the kinds of... Um, family dwellings that have essentially more living space than land surrounding it. So in other words, you have this huge building on not so much property. And uh, also uh, colonial style subdivisions, luxury resorts and golf courses where cane and pineapple once grew. Unless you think that that's unimportant, you have to look at how much water it takes to keep a golf course, you know, sort of running, especially the kind even in a desert where you want to have sort of relatively pristine um, fairways. I mean, the greens and of course uh, the tea are, are the most important green like elements. And you can sort of, as some deserts do, desert uh, locations do is, you know, the fairway doesn't matter too much. It's like one big rough, but um, most golf courses have that kind of uh, pastoral illusion going on with it where you're playing golf is kind of supposed to be on farmland or uh, something more uh, like that. So I just wanted to do this little rant and I'm, it's a much longer article. I commend it to your attention. Uh, the title of it is it's an opinion. Why was there water left to fight the fire in Maui by Naomi Klein and Kabwala Sprout? Um, it is in the Thursday, the 17th, August, 2023 edition of uh, the guardian. And I hope they'll have, you'll have a chance to uh, be better informed about what's going on. The in recent uh, uh, news, the, and as described in the article, there is a a variety of conflicts going on. Certainly, they've uh, taken some of the emergency management people and fired them, or they've re resigned or retired, whatever. Uh, the governor has made some noises about uh, protecting the land interests. The mayor has as well. But uh, as we know. Um, you know, there are other things going on, and a lot of things uh, occur not so transparently. And I think that there will be those issues uh, moving forward after this major disaster where, you know, folks died. It was a huge emergency, a, a major environmental climate catastrophe, a fire uh, down power, downed power lines exacerbated by hurricane force winds. And um, let's just think that's unimportant. Such winds are coming to Los Angeles in a um, in the coming days. Um, they're not going to be as major uh, as Category Four, which it is now in uh, uh, off of Baja California, but it will be significant. And I folk I hope that folks in um, Southern California are aware of those of being prepared for those kinds of things. Okay, that's been my little rant. Um, <laughs> about a place I used to live, uh, my family used to live and grew up uh, several generations. Um, I have warm feelings about it. It, it is paradise.
uh, but it's also a place where you know war occurred um uh, incredible i you know it's it's a it's one of the luscious place places on earth and um Indeed. it is uh uh well worth visiting uh you know uh you you have to sort of get into it, it it's uh it's a place of of magnificence in that sense and a good place to uh relax back to you joe it looks like those those jams have come out really well oh definitely got my jam jam on uh, i have a just question. comment oh go ahead go uh, uh, go ahead joe I, I just had a question i just wanted to comment on the sri lankan uh point that you mentioned that was in the article uh yes. we uh, my family was traveling there about five six years after the tsunami and the state basically prevents any native Sri Lankans from building uh, within one and a half kilometers from the shore uh, because of the potential for future tsunamis. But what happened is that uh, oligarchs, largely Russian investors and I believe Chinese came in and basically have redeveloped all of the, the beachfront real estate. Whereas the native population does not have the ability to regain their, their lost land in the tsunami. That's not unfamiliar in, in those kinds of yeah. situations. Uh, I know that uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, uh, commented on it in his visit to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it it is the the problem of development and one where you do have a a, a kind of uh, it's disaster capitalism at work. It is vulture capitalism at its very very best. But in in terms of the state of Sri Lanka, it its governmental structure or its its social and political structure actually can favor that as a highly divided uh, class structure that would would attract that kind of investment. True. The Colombo also had the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. The yes. Chinese developed the the port of Colombo and imported. I think it's rather exclusively Detective Chinese. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was Chinese prison labor, or basically it was exclusively Chinese labor and local labor to help build this gigantic port of Colombo. Bruce, you had a question? Yeah, or yeah my question was, um, I had read, was reading somewhere that, I can't remember if it was the mayor or the governor, wanted to uh, put a moratorium on land transfers. I was just wondering if you thought it would be successful yeah. at that. Well, one hopes. I, yeah. I don't know. You know, it's, uh, I think if the legislature and the governor are behind it, it's going to happen. So, you know, and... I, I think the political climate favors it, particularly with the um, the death toll. Yeah, I think the one of the good things is it seems like media has already, you know, put set put up the alarm that that, that the eyes are on what happens there. Yeah, they I think they're right on top of it and I think that's really important. And of course, uh in in the intervening years because of this movement towards uh, uh native consciousness, I think that there are a significant number of uh grassroots organizations that are more um engaged with this and and because it fits with the masses, I think it is a question of you know, um property owners, uh corporate property owners, plantation owners ostensibly corporate owners and uh, the people. Wow, I had to cut all that sourness with a lot of sugar. Mm. We uh, ended up converting those tip the bat or lingonberry in English into a nice little jam, as well as the stickles bar, or stickles bar, got the puncture wounds, show and the scratches very uh, thorny bush the gooseberries so these were green gooseberries 
and I had I reduced the to get to the gel point. I had to cook it so long. We we lost the color. So it's a a little brownish red, but um, still going to be a lovely. Yeah. So. And did you have anything else, Anne, or shall we close things out? Thank everyone for coming. We'll be have here next week, same time, same place. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care, all.